Welcome to part four, where I will be describing the ways of representing terminal taxon ranges, um, including using modeling efforts to be able to do that. So again, just to remind you, the two basic inputs that we need for special phylogenetics is a phylogeny that has terminals that are corresponding with a database of spatial occurrence data for those uh, terminals. And um, I want to start by uh, quoting um, Alfred Russell Wallace, who, by the way, was also a British naturalist who went, who was a naturalist on a voyage, and then he came back from his trip and he had his own journals and he has a lot of description about what he saw in various parts of the world which are so congruent with what Charles Darwin also had in his own observations of patterns of biodiversity all over the world. In fact, when the, um, the, the, the theory was made public of, uh, on evolution in 1859, it was published, uh, it was published or presented to the British uh, Natural uh, History Society or, or the professionals there, as jointly the work of Charles Darwin and Alfred Russell Wallace, even though nowadays many people talk about Charles Darwin and people have forgotten about Wallace. But there was a, um, a shortfall or a limited information that was attributed to him that the knowledge about the geographical distribution of most species is incomplete and it is inadequate at all scales most of the time. It is what is referred to as the Wallachian shortfall, which expresses that our understanding of the geographical distribution of many taxa on earth is incomplete. And that tells us that we need to go out there and do more and more of botanizing and field surveys and data collection because we don't have a, a great record of taxa distribution, which can affect our analysis really. So how do we translate occurrence data into range maps? So we, the very first thing we want to do when, once we have all of our records uh, for occurrences of various taxa on the tree, once we have them uh, assembled on a spreadsheet, for example, then we want to, the very first thing you want to do, you want to decide what is the scale of your study. So for example, if you are working at the continental scale, for example, for North America, then you want to decide what is the appropriate scale for this study. The one that was conducted by Brent a couple of years ago, they used a 50 by 50 kilometer scale. That, is, that was their resolution. If you have a, a robust computing capacity, let's say you have some cluster computing or cloud computing, you may choose to use smaller resolution, but then you also want to put into consideration what is the appropriate scale for the species environment relationships for the taxa you are working with. At the very basic level, we can calculate the range for each taxa or uh, for each taxon by just drawing a perimeter around all of the locations where they are found. So let's say you decide the scale of 50 by 50 kilometers, and then each taxon that is found in each of the grid cell of 50 by 50 kilometer grid cell, if a taxon is found there and a taxon is found in another, 50, in another grid cell, you draw, a, you can construct a polygon or a map, a range map around all of the grid cells where the each taxon is located. But then um, there's a lot of assumptions you are making by selecting that scale, that resolution, and there's a lot of as assumptions you are making by selecting, by, by drawing that polygon, because perhaps maybe it occurs elsewhere, which has not yet been discovered. You have restricted or delimited those, uh, or excluded those locations. So another way of, of, uh, of, um, of translating this occurrence data into range map is by 
fitting niche models is by doing species distribution models to predict the occurrence. So in this case, we are taking into account that we have limited information about the full occurrence distribution of each taxon. We don't know where all of them are. And because there are some areas that are inaccessible or because we don't have enough funding or we don't have enough uh, human resources to go out there to do um, field surveys across um, all the areas for each taxon, then we can use models to predict their occurrence. What do you need? You need the occurrence records, the existing occurrence records. And then you need some climatic conditions of downloading layers of climatic um, records, for example, minimum temperature or maximum temperature or annual uh, precipitation and and several other climatic variables that are out there, you can get them from the United States Geological Survey uh, uh, um, website. There are many, many other areas where you can get them. We even have maps all for all over the world, we, and they are, yeah, they kept being improved uh, over time. And these maps are generated using interpolations of weather records or weather station records that have been that have been collected since over 100 years ago and so you can combine the records of each taxon with the climatic conditions associated with the locations to fit distribution models for each of them. And then when you fit the distribution models, then you can sum them up together in sort of an ensemble model to show the richness of the predicted occurrence of each taxon in an area. So that is what you can do. So there are various ways of doing that. There are courses that have been taught on species division modeling, and I'm not going to go into details of that, but I just want to explain the, ba the basic information uh, surrounding that. So this uh, Venn diagram was published by Soberan and Peterson in 2005 in a paper that they published together, showing that the area in the middle of the Venn diagram is the actual location where each plant can be found or is found or located. We call it the realized niche, the area where they are actually found. And then, but the location or where they are found is actually um, driven by three important factors. Number one is, is that environment or location does it have suitable environmental conditions? We call it the abiotic factors. Then if that environment is suitable in terms of the climatic conditions, then what about other existing organisms? Are there competition going on there? Is there some competition or predation or occurring in part of that area that can limit the presence of that taxon in that location? If yes, then that means the organism may not be found there. So the second factor to be considered is biotic interaction, that is favorable biotic interactions. We can think of it like mutualism or commensalism or facilitation and so on. And then let's assume that the conditions in a location are great. The plant will find it favorable. And the biotic interactions are likely going to be great because the plant will find it uh, favorable. But does the plant has the capacity to reach that location in the very first place? So there are many, many areas. I mean, you can take a plant from here and take it to Europe and it will do well. But you are the one taking it there. The plant may not have the capacity to get there naturally on its own. And so dispersal play a role. So wherever you find a plant or an organism, you find it there because the, condition, the environmental conditions are suitable and there are favorable biotic interactions, that is the coexistence of other taxa with that plant uh, is favorable. 
and it has the ability to reach that location. And so for you to fit distribution models, you need the occurrence records of the plant, uh, the longitude and the latitude. You need the predictor variables, as I've mentioned, climatic variables and so on and so forth. And sometimes you may have absence points, whereby areas that have been surveyed and we know for a fact that that plant is not found in that area. Or if you don't have it, you can tell the software you want to use for the model to say, can you just generate some random points all over the entire study area that can be used as background points in place of the absence of absence points or lack of absence points? And so with those three uh, information, you can uh, run your models and your models will give you two outputs. The models will give you an environmental output which shows the, um, sometimes also called the response curves, which shows the relationship of the occurrences of the plant with the environment. Some will give you a, a, a bell-shaped curve whereby the range of favorable conditions is within certain uh, range of environment, for example, maybe between five degrees and 10 degrees. That is where you find the plant uh, located. Anything be below or beyond that, you will not find the plant there. So you will get a bell-shaped curve, for example. And using that information, you can now predict or project throughout the entire study areas which areas are considered to be suitable given what we know about the existing locations of the plant. And you can now predict, and then you'll see maps that shows areas that are predicted to be suitable and areas that have very low uh, uh, probability of occurrence of the plant that you are working with. And when you add that for each of the plant or each of the taxon, you can sum them together to produce an ensemble uh, projection or prediction of presence or probability of presence of all the taxa you are working with that are corresponding to the terminals on that phylogeny. So in ecological sense, when I said the probability of occurrence is 0 0.5, which is random. And so models where the prediction of a, of where if the model says that the particular grid cell, the probability of occurrence is greater than five, is 0 0.5, then that means it's considered to be better than random. And which area grid cells that are predicted to be less than 0 0.5 are predicted to say, well, that area is not suitable for the plant given the uh, prediction. And so there are two ways of dealing with those projected uh, map projections. Many cases, people will binarize them. So areas, grid cells that are predicted to be less, to be 0 0.5 and below, some people will just classify them as zero. That is, that those areas are not suitable for the, for the, uh, for the plant. And areas that have 0 0.5 and above, uh, 0 0.51 and above are predicted to be suitable for the plant. Uh, some choose different thresholds. Some may say, well, I don't want to use 0 0.5, let me use 0 0.7 and, and so on and so forth, depending on your understanding of the biology of the species that you are working with. Um, as another option is to use those raw continuous probability values um, uh, without changing them, without binarizing them into zeros and one, which is uh, an approach that was used by one of our colleagues, Matt Kling, in the example I'm going to be uh, demonstrating um, or explaining later on. So um, I should also mention that there are a few potential issues with modeling is that if your data you are using have errors in them, the models will not detect that they are errors. The models will assume that you have already done your assignment by cleaning the data before you bring them into the softwares. So um, if you put in garbage in into the models, it will give you a garbage out. So you have to be very careful with that uh, with a lot of errors. And then of course, you want to choose the right spatial resolution. You want to choose 
predictor variables that are not too correlated with each other. Otherwise, it will over inflate the predictions you are going to get from those models. Um, take in uh, take for uh, in account the fact that the predictor variables you are using were produced from interpolation of data sets collected from weather stations. If the weather stations are too far away from each other, then it increases the likelihood of errors coming from those predictor variables. Closer weather stations will give you better interpolation. And then sometimes there may be some um, some interactions, unexpected interactions that could be taking place among the variables. For example, temperature could interact with precipitation, especially in higher elevations. So you want to think about that as well. And then your choice of variables you are using um, can also affect the, the, the model output. So it is really, really important for you to have a clear understanding of each of the variables that are available and their relationships with the taxa that you want to fit the models. Again, again, and again, scales matter. Scales is really, really important. And so you want to choose the appropriate scale. And it also de it depends both on the biology of the species uh, of the taxa you're working with, and also it depends on the computational power that you have available. But just bear in mind that the scale can, can have an impact on the questions you are answering, the, the results you are getting, which can affect the signal for the information that you need from those results. So scale, yeah, scale, for you, uh, again, another way of uh, emphasizing the importance of choosing the right skill for your study. Um, so how do we do this kind of analysis? You need the abelian records, you need the ecological conditions, and then you fit the models, uh, as I uh, mentioned earlier, and then you combine that mo those models, you make a range map from those models, and then you combine them with the phylogeny you have. And once you have everything ready to this point, then you are ready to do the special phylogenetics. And this is where Brent is going to be explaining a little bit more in the next part on what is the next thing. Once you have the range maps for each of the taxa you're working with and you have a phylogeny, what are the next thing? This is now where we get to the exciting part in part five on how to run those special phylogenetic analysis themselves. So if you have any question, I'll be happy to answer those questions at this point.